beginning a new series um, for this month called uh, Turning the Wheel of the Dharma. And um, Albert put on the website a very Theravadan, very linear look at opening and uh, turning the wheel of the Dharma in terms of uh, clarifying all our imperfections and so forth. And I thought we would start off maybe by talking a little bit about that. But before that, Gregory and I would like to begin with a chant which we use in Soto Zen before we begin meditation. And we'll do it in Sino-Japanese and then in English. And we don't agree about the English translation. That's what our <laughs> little back and forth was about. It's very short, and we'll begin just to uh, set the tone. Would you like to begin? Thank you. Zai, Zai. that I would like to set is friendship and love. And um, I think uh, in the beginning I should introduce my really dear friend and uh, Dharma brother Gregory, who is really wonderful. We have known one another for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. We met at session. Mm -hmm. We discussed, we're trying to figure out today when we actually did meet and what session it was and where it was and who was there. and. The session is an extended period of meditation, and it was 20 years ago, wasn't it? 20, 21 years Something ago. Something like that, yeah. 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 In Santa Fe. And, um, and then I disappeared for a while, and he disappeared for a while, and I walked into his bookstore on 16th and uh, Valencia one afternoon, and we sort of reintroduced ourselves and sort of picked up right from where we last left off. Yeah, no gap. No gap whatsoever. And... Um, when I think of a man, uh, when you sit with someone in a zendo for a long period of time and share a lot, there's, it's a, a little bit like a marriage or relationship in some ways. There, we don't quite finish one another's sentences, but when we start, you sort of know exactly where you're going or the memories pop up and there's a lot to share. Nor do we agree about everything. You know, we definitely do not. Um, but we, uh, we uh, have a very, um, when I think of uh, my Dharma brother, I think of Gregory. Likewise. And you can say something about me if you like. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be you're right back here. Yeah, right. Well, uh, Ken and I met at a session in Santa Fe. And, uh, and we also knew each other from here in the early days when uh, Isan first uh, came here, and uh, there's a quality that we've been trying to articulate uh, about what it was that Isan communicated. It was so palpable to everybody who knew him, and that Ken always seemed to be uh, in a 
deep accord with. And I've wondered about it for years because Yassan seemed to carry this like nobody else. He brought it forward to everybody. He included everybody. He had this quality of stability and so forth. And Ken, to my uh, sights, always reflects this quality. Um, why do we practice? What's it for? Why do we do it? What does it resolve? And uh, <laughs> when Ken and I get together, I don't have to ask that question. And so, uh, and it's kind of funny because uh, uh, it doesn't mean that there's, you know, not various kinds of human things any more than it was with this one. But there's something underneath that. And I think that that's why we practice as Buddhists, for the opportunity to see things more deeply, to let the various kinds of uh, obscurations fall away. And I've always felt, right from the very start, when Ken and I met, that uh, that he just showed that, just like his son did, on every day. And so uh, we've carried on this friendship for a long, long time with this in mind of asking each other the question about what, you know, repeating the question to each other almost rhetorically, what, what was it that Isan brought to bear? How, how did it happen that he was so open and so steady and so unpresuming uh, and so deep and so loving and so kind? And so when Ken and I talk about that, we remember Isan together. And we remind each other of Isan uh, in each other's company. And I think he had it in mind that we could maybe share some of that with you. Because, you know, I mean, he's been gone for over 20 years. He, he, he's not dead. And for someone to have been, you know, so-called dead for so long and still be so vibrantly alive is something that astonishes both of us, I think. And maybe all the people who knew him too, because he's still so vibrantly present. So, Ken reflects that, and we've shared that in remembering Yassan, and, uh, and uh, I couldn't think of a better emissary and a better representative than Ken. Well, I'm really humbled, actually, by that. Thank you. I try. Yeah, I guess that hardly um, a day goes by when I don't have some interaction or something occurs and I don't actually think of something that Yassan said or did. Um, that's how powerful it was. And he was not... I mean, he wasn't an overwhelming presence, you know. He, was, um, he wasn't... Um, he certainly wasn't an alpha male. <laughs> you know, we were we were kind of joking about um, um, this on the way up. There are people who have tried to um, make him into some kind of a Buddhist saint since he's been dead, and um, we both object to that. Yeah. Um, although a bodhisattva in high heels ain't too bad, we yeah. might we might go for that. <laughs> um, and uh, I think he might too. But he was certainly no saint. Um, but I was thinking back to the first time that I met him in 1988 or 88 or 87. I can't quite remember. I was volunteering for the Zen Hospice Volunteer Program, and he was one of the speakers on the um, agenda in, in an afternoon. And I had just taken care of a, a woman friend of mine who died of lung cancer, and it hadn't been an easy death. And it hadn't been, um, and the relationship with the family was all screwed. The usual things that kind of happen around the end of life, or something like that. And I was kind of all twisted up and knots about it. And at the middle of the afternoon, Zen Frank Ossieski and the Zen Hospice Program said, "Now we're going to hear from his son." And in comes this little flitty thing across the room, and he's sort of floating in very lightly, and he bows to all the statues, and he's kind of bouncing around and happy, and, and I, oh, God, get her. You know? <laughs> I mean, I was, I, yeah, I was like, well, 
So yeah, I didn't expect much, was, uh, just to set the stage. And he sat down on this platform in front, and we were all sitting in chairs. And I was sort of bouncing around with all my preoccupations. And um, for some reason, I just put up my hand and said, you know, I just had this terrible time with this uh, person I was sit sitting with who was dying. And I thought this was supposed to be great, and I was supposed to feel wonderful after this happened. And everything was supposed to open up, and this was a great generous deed that I had done, and it doesn't feel that way. So I just said that, but at the same time, Isan just turned around and he looked at me, and for some reason I understood right then that he had given me his complete, absolute, undivided attention in a way in which I couldn't imagine. That there was not that there was no one else in the room, or not that my considerations were unimportant, but he was absolutely with me, totally with me. And I spoke for a little bit, and then I even forget what he said. You know, it might have been something like, oh, you know, these things happen, or we all have our laundry list or something. But in that moment, all of my preoccupations and all of my worries fall away. And I said, I want what that guy wants, what that guy has. And I resolved to practice with him, and within four months, I was living upstairs in this, in the attic of this building. What about you? What happened the first time you met this yeah. time? Um, I was in college, and I'd heard about Zen Center through a, a class that I was taking with a friend of mine on Gandhi and nonviolence. And we had both, it turned out, had read Suzuki Roshi's book. He said that Suzuki Roshi had a temple here in town. I didn't know it at the time. He said, let's meet there. So I said, okay. And uh, uh, so it turned out that he didn't show up. I knocked on the door. Who answered the door but Tommy Dorsey, his son. And you know, Zen Center, you've been there. It's a formidable place. You knock on the door, and somebody, especially if somebody peeks through the door and they say, they're like, "What are you? What's the password? What are you doing here?" You know, kind of thing, you know? And uh, but this time wasn't like that. He opened the door wide. He said, "Oh!" I said, "I I came here to see my friend, and uh, uh, he didn't show up." And he said, "Well, come on out in." <laughs> and uh, so you know, he he just was. Instantly open. He said, oh, here's the Buddha Hall, and let's go get a cup of tea first. And so we got a cup of tea, and he showed me around the kitchen, showed me around everything. Had our tea, and with this, let's go down and see the uh, Zendo. Go down and see the Zendo. Oh, wait, here's the, here's the Dencho Bell. Uh, it's impressive, you know. And people are, you know, running around doing things. And he said, here, here's the hammer. And he puts the hammer in my hand. Extremely declarative, you know. I mean, here, like this. Oh, oh, I, hit it. Hit it? He said, yeah, hit it like this. And he grabs it out of my hand. He goes, dong, you know. And everybody in the, in the, in the Zendo, I mean, in the, around the hallway there, are kind of looking at him like, what did you just do? It's not time for that, you know. <laughs> and he said, here, you, uh, here, you do it. And, uh, I, you know, this is my... I'm only in the place for 10 minutes, you know, he's having me hit this bill. So, so I, I take it and I kind of go, oh, you know. He goes, no, 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 not like that. He grabs it back to me and he did, boom, you know. And people are shocked, you know, they're, they're, they're scandalized almost, you know. They can't do this around here like that. So he put it back in my hand and he made sure that I hit it hard. Uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of that kind of uh, uh, gesture, that kind of energy, coming from someone who had no authority, who was uh, worried about his own, how people viewed him, or what he wasn't concerned about any of that, and he was he was concerned about how I felt when I was there. You, yeah, yeah, and and right from the start. Now, what I should tell you is that that was a pivotal event in my life. It must have saved my life a thousand times because he was there. I'm quite serious about it. 
And, and uh, when I think back about that, I think now for two years after that at Zen Center, you should all know this, nobody called me by name, nobody gave me the time of day, nobody instructed me about anything, and I was too intimidated to ask. I thought people were going to come up behind me with the Kosako and just, you know, just whack me. You know? I didn't know, and I didn't know to ask. His son had gone to Tassajar or something after that. So, but what Issan did gave me the strength to persevere. And I, from that point on, I went three times a week. It wasn't long after that I met Baker Roshi. But if it hadn't been for Issan, I would have walked out the door and never come back. And because of Issan, because of the quality of his warmth and generosity and character and the, just how open he was to show me around, he made it possible for me to look deeper and stay with it and to find the joy of practice that I wouldn't have found otherwise. So that's my first story of this song. That's wonderful. You know, I, I've heard, I, I mean, not to not to say anything about your story or to <laughs> <dead brain. laughs> but, but I think I've heard that story over the years, maybe 40 times. <laughs> People Have I in, this in one no. way, no, <laughs> no, but but forty different people have said in so many words that you know uh, if it wasn't for the way in which Isan greeted me or welcomed me or diffused some petty kind of thing that was going on at Zen Center, I would have been out of there. I wouldn't be here now. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have practiced. I wouldn't have stuck with it. And he had that quality that was so wonderful. Um, yeah. Tell us, tell a fire story. Oh, okay. Well, I like to tell this in terms of a koan, because I've been studying the koans for a number of years. And um, there's a koan in the Wuman Khan. This, this, uh, this um, student um, goes to sit in front of his teacher. And the teacher says, okay, you've been here a long time sitting, so tell me what it's all about. And the student gets up and he kicks over the water jar that's sitting there and he said, you and your goddamn questions, and he stomps out. Ah, what are we to make of that? So there's this situation. What is the teaching? What are we going to make of it? Um, I was sitting at one time, um, we, in the hospital, I was, I was here, um, I moved into Hartford Street about six months after J.D. and, and Bernie, who were the first men in the Maitri Hospice, moved into the upper rooms here. And I lived up in the attic before we opened up this other building as the hospice. And I wasn't the director of the hospice at that time or anything. I was just a guy, you know. But I remember that Isan was having, uh, there was some contentious thing going on with um, Oh, a guy who is dying and the partner wanted him to be in a particular place and wanted something to happen to his assets and something. That, anyway, it was a very contentious and argument. And there was a Zen monk involved with it and parents involved and the partner. And the poor guy was sitting there with dementia who was just kind of out of it. And all this was going on in the table right upstairs above our head. And um, it was going on. At that time, Isan was running in the afternoons, he also had advanced stages of HIV, and his temperature in the afternoon would go to 102, 103, and he would have to get up and he'd wear this little bandana around his head and be sweating and kind of get on with his day and have to go back upstairs and lie down. But he came down and he sat down at the table in the middle of this conversation. And as soon as he sat down, everybody was quiet and stopped talking and he just said, oh no, just go on. So the conversation started again and the argument continued and the back and forth continued. And then at some point it stopped. And his son got up and there was a flower arrangement, kind of a homemade ikibana kind of thing in the middle. Maybe Gregory had done it, I'm not sure. No, yeah, no not you. <laughs> the Gregory had oh, yes. at, um, uh, around the corner. Anyway, this is a little, and he just got up and he turned the arrangement 
And everybody just looked at the flower differently. And then he got up and left. And somehow, the whole argument was settled. It had completely gone. It was like a miracle. And all he did was he just sat, he listened, he did this little gesture, and things somehow got clear. And I think that you saw that happen numerous times. Many times. Many times. Just this, what, this way of paying attention that is so hard to put your finger on. And when you're there and you see it, you know it. We talked a little bit about this as we were preparing. Like, how do we know when we actually are in the presence of real teaching or a real teacher? And I said, well, you know it when you're there and you feel it and you can taste it. And you agree. That's right. That's right. But, so that quality was very present and it's still very difficult to define because there isn't a set rule, you know, you can't say, there's no checklist for authentic teaching, you know, kick the bowl, you know, arrange the flower, be quiet, tell everybody to listen, tell everybody to continue, you know, there's nothing like that, it just sort of happens and it, it, it's a quality of attention. I think more than anything with Isan it was simply his ability to listen to people and to understand and you know that certainly came from his coming to practice out of deep pain. Yeah. Yeah, not averting from that. What about the deep pain do you know? <laughs> Just about the same thing everybody else does. I, think, yeah. pretty much. I remember no. one time well, Baker she said uh, I was pretty shocked. He said I think everybody has about the same amount of pain. Mm. And I was offended by that. I thought I, I didn't believe it. I thought I had more pain. Than and if you looked at this on, you certainly said that guy had a lot of pain. No, know? he 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 fashioned a life of it, uh, of uh, unwavering compassion out of that. Yeah. But the story that I wanted you to mention was the story about arranging the flowers where they were. Oh, that story. Oh, that one. Yeah. Oh, the other flower. Oh, the yeah, other. yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. If you don't mind. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll tell that one. So you notice that there's all this stuff about the altar and you can see everything in this. This room isn't quite as sort of elaborate as Zen Center is or meticulously put together, but at Zen Center everything is like here and everything is a certain number of millimeters from there. and. In the Ikebana arrangement, you know, the one flower has to be a certain height and the other flower has to be this height and, you know, and this poor guy, actually I see him here on Friday night sometimes in the recovery group, who was in here and he was working and he was sweating and he was trying to make the flower arrangement right and he was doing it and this and he got all tight and knot about it. And his son came by and looked at him and he said, mm, what's the problem? And he said, I just can't get this flower arrangement right. His son said, I'll just show you how to do it. And he said, well, I take all the flowers, and I pick out the dead ones, and I put them in the bowl, and then I kind of jiggle around, and then I jump back. Oh, that's perfect! <laughs> 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 and, um, yeah, that was it. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> so there was that quality of just being able to be with what's present and to take joy and laughter in it, and, um, yeah. One time he was, he and I were going to go get a drink. He said, have you ever had a Tangere martini? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what's that? <laughs> he said, oh yeah, it's a kind of gin. And I said, oh. He said, well, we have to go get a drink. I said, okay. So we were going to go around the corner, and we started to go around the corner. And we got, I forgot it was some bar upstairs, uh, just down the street on, uh, on 6, uh, 18th there. But there was a drunk on the, laid out on the deck, on the sidewalk. And uh, his son bent over and he said, uh, are you all right? And the guy goes, eh. <clears throat> Then he said, have you eaten? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, would you like something to eat? And I said, yeah. He said, 
oh, well, come to my house. <laughs> Meaning here, right? <laughs> so the guy said, okay. And so the, this son got under one arm, I got under the other arm. We brought that guy here. And he never left. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, I mean, that was the thing. I, that, I was just astonished by it. He wasn't, he, his son wasn't put off by anything. He, when he made that offer, he made it to that fellow for his life. And he really meant it. Like that, yeah. 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 So we had to wait for our martini. <laughs> <laughs> not too long, I hope. No, it wasn't no, but too, long. It wasn't too long. <laughs> Yeah, there was a quality about him that, you know, I'm kind of super intellectual, hyper-intellectual, hyper-whatever. And his son's very straightforward and matter-of-fact. You, he, Many people looked at him and said he was almost simple-minded, that it was so clear and direct. And I remember one time I was having an awful hard time and... I came downstairs and he said, oh, he said, Ken, what's the matter? He said, I'm, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that, I'm feeling that. He looked at me and he said, oh, he said, just clean out your closet. It really, you know, when I get feeling like that, it really, it helps to clean out my closet. So I'm going like, okay, clean out the closet. I got it. I met Harvey Milk. I know. I'll come out. I'll go clean out the closet. I'll be honest about who I am and blah, blah, blah. Next day I come downstairs and it's standing, he's standing in the same place and the door, it, he had kind of this full length mirror on the door at the bottom of the stairs and it was open and he was in there and he was folding underwear in the closet. Yeah. And, I, and I look at him he said, yeah, see, I do it myself. Clean out the closet. It really <laughs> helps. That's what he meant. Clean out the closet. <laughs> it was very clear. And it was, and so, you know, and it, in some sense, I heard, remember, um, I had, you know, the privilege of being around him in his, the last year of his life in the last days, and it was a remarkable teaching. Um, he, he received a really, really terrible, crushing news from the doctor who said, you know, the lymphoma is advanced and, you know, you're going to only have a few days to live, and... Um, he was really shaken by it. You could see that he was shaken. And so he was home, and he, he got home, he got upstairs. Anyway, he, um, I, I usually dropped in at about, well, it was routine. We sat down here at 6, and I would go up about 5.15 if he was going to come down and maybe check in on him and see what was going on. And he was on the phone with uh, Dick Baker, his teacher. And, um, and there were two parts of the conversation. One was, oh, okay, oh, so yes. So let's see, you're giving me some meditation. So he looked at me, he said, just a minute, I'm getting some meditation instruction from my teacher. And uh, he wrote down, he, and, and he said, I, I have to write it down because I don't want to forget it or mix it up. Okay, the first breath is, if this is the first breath of my life. And I breathe out, and this is as if it is the last breath of my life. And he wrote it down very carefully, first breath, first breath of my life, last breath, the last breath of my life. And then he took, said, now, now, Roche, he said, I've written this down, so the first breath is going to be as if this were the first breath of my life, and when I breathe out, it's as if this were the last exhalation of my life. And... And, okay, yes, I got that down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you better come by pretty quickly because uh, the doctor told me I only have 10 days. Oh, you can't make it for two weeks. Well, that's too bad. You're going to miss me. I probably only have three or four days. <laughs> you know, and I'm listening to this ordinary conversation where he completely wrote down some very simple meditation instructions so he would actually remember it and get it right that his teacher told him and that he was going to die within three or four days. And that he better get here quick. Well, Dick Baker actually did rearrange his schedule and get here, but there was this, oh, that's too bad you're going to miss me because <laughs> the doctor says I'm not going to last 10 days. And, you know. So there was that kind of quality about him that was ordinary. And then I turned around and, and I said, son, how does this feel? How does it feel almost, you know, how does it feel being right at the point of like dying? He said, he looked at me, he said, I'm going to be terrified. <laughs> Jeez. I'm going to be terrified. 
And then it was like, oh, but now how many people are here for dinner? Now, make sure that it all, I don't want them to have spaghetti out of the can. Please make them something nice. Can you make it from scratch? So I wound up for that week. I mean, it did last another week after that. And everybody was coming by, and there were maybe 40 people a day coming in to see him and say goodbye. All these then people were coming by, and all teachers and students from the past. And they all had spaghetti, and not one drop of it came out of a ragu can. <laughs> When Big Roshi came, he, he told the story that uh, he talked about tokenism a lot. And people objected to the idea of tokenism you know, a lot. By which you mean? By which uh, the gesture, you know, yeah. that the, the tendency was to think when that word was used that it was uh, phony or false. But anyway, Big Roshi got here, it was before he died, and he went to see this aunt laying down. And he said to his son, um, I wish, his son, I wish I could go instead of you. And his son looked at him very sharply and he said, You'll get your chance. So this was the rebuke to Baker Roshi, you know, and you don't usually rebuke Baker Roshi, but it was like, pow, you know, it was about to be undone. <laughs> and Roshi, for his part, he really loved it. Yeah, he really yeah, loved you'll it. get your chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions out there? Anybody have any comments or anything they'd like to say about anything that we've said so far? This is a conversation. Yes, Suki. I'm just curious about it. When he, how he got into the into the practice, who was he before? Ah, you know, like like how, he, how he found his way. Yeah. Oh, I know something about the story. Go ahead. So, um, and it's some of it's recounted in Street Sin, but um, he was, uh, you know, he had been a drag performer in San Francisco after the war, after he got thrown out of the Navy during the Korean War. Was he, he was Yeah, yeah. Adele. Yeah. And um, they performed at the Black Cat, and they got involved, heavily involved in amphetamines and heroin. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of mafia money and all kinds of underground stuff. And then he joined a commune over in the Haight-Ashbury, and he was the leader of the commune. And one day he decided, well, after he did this kind of really druggy thing about going around and deciding that every, they had to pick up everything on the street and make the street clean. You can imagine that. They were picking up garbage on the street. And, and he said, you know, I had to clean myself up. So he didn't want to get into a 12-step 12, 12 program and, and that, for whatever reasons, but he decided that the spiritual aspect of it was really important and that he would go to sit meditation with, um, with Suzuki Roshi at uh, the old Bokuchi temple on uh, Sokuchi. Sokuchi. Oh, yeah. Sokuchi on, yeah. on uh, Bush, yep. and Bush Street and Laguna. Mm -hmm. And so he would get up and go there in the morning. And he'd go in this little hippie thing with a little headdress on and um, his little bell-bottom jeans and he would go <laughs> in and, uh, and he would sit down and do meditation with, uh, with, um, with uh, Suzuki Roshi. And that's basically the entrance into Zazen. And it was funny, you know, when I think about that being, um, having a history of addiction myself and dealing with that, um, that it was simply the taste of Zazen and the understanding of Zazen. And at some point, drugs and alcohol, although he didn't become abstinent, they actually, he got the whole thing under control only and the, it seemed to me that the main, motiva main motivation was his zazen. Nothing interferes with my meditation. And um, so he did come in in a lot of pain and with a heavy drug habit and cleaned it up. And then within, I guess within a year, he was from, they moved, he moved into Zen Center after they bought it and then was down at Tassajara and did an, about 12 or 15 practice periods down there. I don't know how many he did. I know something like that, yeah. yeah. 12 or 15 practice periods at, in Tassajara. And he also then was the 
um, guest master at the house halfway between yeah, Pasahara Jamesburg. and Jamesburg. Yeah. There's a picture of him I have on my website of him and James with a horse at Jamesburg. Yeah. And um, yeah. So yeah, in sex and drugs and rock and roll, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the pain that that brings, and trying to find some kind of escape or relief from that that suffering. Mm -hmm. But he had a capacity, right? Even through his problems, oh, yeah. from what I understand, uh, to accept things. To accept. Just to accept things. And it was interesting because, uh, especially at Zen Center at the time too, the, I, there's this idea, well, you push a little harder, you make, you make a little stronger effort, you stay an extra hour after the, the, the practice uh, day is over, and, you know, this kind of feeling. But Isan didn't reflect that kind of feeling, you know. And it was interesting because uh, he had more authority without that than he did, than he would have if he tried to pose it. And he had more authority than, than uh, a kind of burly expression of, of Zen because he was, uh, he was sincere. He was immediately present. He was completely available. And so, uh, uh, but in that climate, he was generally dismissed. And he just went ahead, did whatever he did, you know, ironing his tabbies, you know. Oh, you know? Ironing. Oh, that yeah. man could iron. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to iron your shirt. Yeah, you saw very well. Very well. Yeah. <laughs> iron, okay. But so so, and then everybody was shocked when when he was the the heir apparent. He he, he was the first person to which. Uh, I think that if you would ask anybody at Zen Center. Who, who will uh, make Hiroshi make his number one? Isan would have been far down the list. Or not existent on the list. Not existent on the list, maybe even. Yeah. And, yet, and yet, it was that, those qualities of receptivity and, and the interaction between he and Roshi, which was seamless over time and all of that, that, that uh, you know, his, his immense qualities, of, not just of acceptance, though, of, of, uh, of steadiness and warmth and uh, openness and uh, uh, he was he, oh you mentioned this is the thing that, that struck me you mentioned that he made zazen the most important thing mm -hmm. and he, he did that was it he could anything else might vary but zazen did not vary and so in that you know he established that particular detail and that you know gave him the strength he needed to deal with whatever else he dealt with and, he, and you know he had all the positions every single position at Zen Center he, he did Sometimes, several times, he was a director, and he was, you know, and he was Tonto, and he did all those things. He said, "What's doing?" I mean, they're not that easy to do, and he just did it. So, uh, but I don't think he, you know, I, I, he just could do it. I don't know how he could do it, but he didn't. It was like that flower story that he told. It was just, yeah. he just made it possible, and he made it possible for other people to do their job too. Albert, um, how would you? Describe how would you interpret the teaching of the turning of the wheel of the Dharma in terms of this son and getting away from that Theravadan approach that you referred to on the website and, and and also harking to your title this afternoon, which is turning the wheel of the Dharma in the queer community. How was that accomplished aside from the obvious, which is opening? Uh, Hartford Street, or getting uh, Baker Roshi to help them out with Hartford well, Street. Well, we're sitting in the room in which it sort of happened. Um, this room has been the um, temple of the uh, Shambhala group, which was associated with Chokin Trumpa in the 70s, and then all of a sudden the Castro exploded with an influx of gay men and women, but mostly men in those days, but a thousand a month coming into the Castro. And Shambhala moved out, and um, and a bunch of uh, gay men actually took over the lease, gay Buddhist men, because I know I dated one of them and came here in those days. <laughs> Um, and uh, they still, but it was more like a loose-knit community of men who had some affiliation with Buddhism. 
and it was in 1980 or 82 that Dick Baker asked Isan to join the Gay Buddhist Fellowship, or not, it wasn't, I forget the exact name, but it was an association of gay men and women who were interested in Buddhism, and Isan they used to meet here. And in 1982, they asked him to become their resident teacher at the same time that he was going back and forth to, mm -hmm. um, to uh, Santa Fe and Crestone then to get prepared for his transmission from Dick Baker. And uh, so he came into this environment and he painted the walls white and he moved in and set up a, a formal schedule of meditation. And, um, you know, and as I'm looking over what the key was, you know, um, we mentioned a little bit about Nuntro when we came down, you know, mm -hmm. the Tibetans will start you off with 100,000 bows. Well, there's been more than 100,000 hours, many hundreds of thousands of hours of Zazen right here in, in this room. room. In this room. And innumerable ordinations and weddings and same-sex couples and straight couples. You, my wife and I were married here. It was twenty-two years, twenty ago. years ago, and 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 uh, same-sex couples before it even became an issue or anything. He would marry people down here, and innumerable funerals and ordinations, and the practice was here. That's all you do. You start doing these things. You sit meditation. You practice. And he just was here saying, join me in practice. And also, yeah. and also Maitri, which he well, opened, Maitri was the first the Buddhist hospice in the world. And, you know, I was thinking a little bit about that, because we were back and forth about this. Um, Albert wanted to know how coming home and the dates related and the finding of the founding of Maitri. And I was here in 88, and Steve Allen was the director, and a year later I became the director. Um, and we were behind coming home by about a year mm -hmm. in terms of the hospice, but you know, this was the first Buddhist hospice founded in, in the West. And it wasn't a big deal. Like, his son didn't say, oh, we need a hospice, let's throw out a banner, let's do a, let's do a feasibility study, we need to write it up, we need to get a committee together. He just said, oh, JD is home, Pierre, can't take care of them anymore. I think that room is open and we should move in there and I'll take care of them. Yeah. What about the story of the young man who was outside that he dragged in? Yeah. Dying on the sidewalk? Or? Well, in, you know, that was, um, yeah. So there are several versions of that story. Right, I, that's obviously. why I wanted clarification. Yeah. Get people, and get um, and people people tell that the story in, in in lots of different ways. But there was a there were several men who did have HIV who his son took in and either stayed for some period of time until they could get more more um, more. Um, stable environment and they lived in the house like the fellow who was drunk on the street whom I don't know but you know that story there have been a lot of people through here <laughs> and um, in um, but the actual first resident of the hospice was um, JD and JD uh, uh, he had a Polish name his, his father was I remember him very well actually I can see him and I can't remember his last name but uh, his his he and his partner were members of the sangha, and Pierre um, could no longer take care of JD at home. They lived up on on, on Twin Peaks, and Isan said, "I'll take care of him." And that was the beginning of the hospice. It wasn't a big, you know. It, and then 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 um, um, Bernie Ortiz came right after him. He was the second the second person in the hospice, and they lived upstairs. And then all of a sudden, his son said, we need more room. And he found somebody who bought the building next door and leased it back to us. And then he said, I need somebody to help get the cable bill paid. And he grabbed me and said, you're going to have to go out and get that cable bill paid because I can't not watch Star Search. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
he loved Star Search. <laughs> Star Search and the Golden Girls. It was great. No, so so but but there was that kind of quality. The the, qual the thing that was it was no big deal. He wasn't making a statement. He was simply doing the next thing. Yeah. You know, it was somebody he saw somebody in need and his heart opened in a particular way and then he also knew that he had HIV and that he was going to die. And the question was how do I want to die? What kind of what kind of environment do I want to create for my own death? How do I want to be surrounded with friends and family? And that was that was the that was the genesis of, of my tree hospice. It wasn't that we have to have a Buddhist hospice, we have to bring attention and meditation and practice to people who are dying. It's simply, oh, this is what we're gonna do. And then who's out here to come and help us do it? And I happen to be standing there. <laughs> and he happened to say, you, you, oh, come on over. You like that, why don't you move in? It didn't have to be perfect. I mean, I can remember his son coming down those stairs uh, 24 hours or less before he died. And, uh, and he, you know, came into this room and he, and he bowed at the altar and he, he it was interesting because he, he, he started to cry a little bit and then he stopped and then he started to smile. Yeah. And he looked around and everybody was here. He started to smile and then he completed his bows and he had to be, didn't he have to be helped bowing yeah. to the oh, yeah, full sure. bow? You know, he just, he just, each thing just had its own presence. And so it, it, it had a kind of a, there was, it's a funny thing, in spite, of, in spite of his infirmity, it assured everybody. He was still taking care of everybody up until the last minute or two. Unbelievable. And it was astonishing because, you know, because he'd, he'd think, oh, maybe I'm going to die in, 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 in not so long, you know, and the tears would start to come down, or he'd look around and, you know, all these loving faces, you know. It was just, you know, but he, that's, I think he was that way even before, you know, he had transmission and, you yeah. know, I mean, it's just, it just deepened the kind of person he was, you know, uh, uh, right from the get-go. And it just brought out his, his best qualities, which he, which he freely gave away to everybody. There was a kind of graciousness to it, mm -hmm. also, yeah. and um, that's um, <laughs> you know, I mean, and a kind of honesty to it, like you right. know, like that's you'll, like like you'll get yours, you know, you'll have your chance. He says <laughs> to his teacher, like you know, oh, it's so much, but but it, it, there was a kind of um, yeah, it, it was just um, I remember Angie Runyon. Um, was going to sew a rakasu for him, this thing that we wear out of a robe that Suzuki Roshi had worn. So he had a nice, you know, the nice brown color and it was had history to it, everything. And I remember after his son came back from the hospital the last time, I called Angie and said, hey, how's that rakasu coming along, you know, uh, can you get it done? And she said, oh, it's going to take me at least three weeks. I said, how about 24 hours <laughs> and uh, she said what and I said yeah 24 hours so she finished it in 24 hours and came over here and we went upstairs and she gave it to his son it was the last time they met they were old friends they had been ordained fairly close together um, tea ceremony. no no tea, huh? ceremony. tea ceremony yes that was a tea ceremony person yeah and Angie gave it to him and um, and that was the that was the rakasu that he wore when he couldn't put on his robe anymore. He had his bathrobe on, and, yeah. and he had that rakasu. Um, but it was like the graciousness with which he accepted that from Angie. I was present. You know, it was like just like, oh, yeah, this is, and it just meant, and it's just like, just, yeah. All I can say is gracious and wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I heard. This is just total hearsay, yeah. and since you were there, maybe you'd be able to confirm it or not. I had heard that when he would, when uh, Isan was down, you know, like within the last 
few hours or so, someone came and said, you know, speaking of zingers, you know, he said, that someone said, oh, I'm really going to miss you. And that Isan's response Are you going to him somewhere? was, yeah, where are you going? Are you going somewhere? <laughs> no, actually, I, over, I, over, I know exactly it was, it was, it was. So Michael Jambles, who was uh, Shunko, the, uh, and he was one of the people who was helping take care of him at the end, one of his two watch dogs. So he's going, he was taking him back and forth from the bathroom and he needed help. And so his son had gone to the bathroom and he was coming back and, and, and Michael just leaned over and said, his son, I'm just going to miss you so badly, you know, when you're gone. And his son looked at me and said, are you going somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't meant I mean, that was yeah. like, that was real. Are you going somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like he literally, like, the, talk about living your moments. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was just, yeah. yeah it, was, it, it was just, um, yeah, really mm -hmm. remarkable. Yeah. Fully, um, yeah, over here in the oh, right. Mm -hmm. I, I just love these song stories, and thank you so much for sharing. And, uh, and it sounds like he did teach so much by just his example in oh. life. But did he have any favorite, uh, I don't want to say, Dharma talks that you recall, or sutras, or anything? He didn't seem to be like that kind of a guy. He seemed like, a, like, like you said, I see someone on the street, I'm going to go help him. He loved Baker Russian. I can tell you that. Okay. And, he's an and he loved Kanzeyan, Yo Butsuhu, He would sing that forever. Who does it? And he would sing that when he was ironing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and he loved Sazen. Yeah, well, you said, yeah, you said that, yeah, that was a major, yeah, was a major part. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was actually my question, too, was um, it seemed like that the meditation and the practice really gave him an anchor and a structure. Oh. That had been again his previous life, you know, had been kind of I don't know my sense of it is that you know, he was kind yeah. of all over the map, and that kind of anchored him. And then he relied on that particularly, you know, I think to cope with his illness. And I think that's what I think was able to get him through what you know must have been an awful experience at times. So. Well, he helped so many people at that point. Yeah, and uh, so he knew the territory. The uh, the thing. You know the thing about the thing about it was that even in his death, and even even he wanted to make his death a gift to other people. Mm -hmm. You know, he did it publicly. It wasn't alone. He was open about it. He was totally open about it. He shared it with everyone who came in the door. They would ask him a question, and he would be right there with an answer with a response. And um, and for him to be able to decide that, you know, some people have said that, um, I remember one Zen monk who's a good friend of mine, and at the end said, oh, well, you know, hospice was just founded because his son didn't want to die alone and want to be surrounded by friends. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> and, um, and, and he made this available to more than a thousand people who mm. have since died at Maitri, who have had that experience, and you still go there, and you go, this is a family, this is a place where I can look at my death and and die openly and be accepted and have my first breath be my first breath and my last breath be my last breath. Thanks so much. You want, you want us to go? <laughs> Gregory is signaling that we're going to go eat cookies. The kitchen awaits. And the kitchen awaits. So I invite, uh, and, and, and uh, Gregory and I will be upstairs, and hopefully we can continue this conversation. And um, um, thank you for your attention. And um, we'll take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.